So last week's lessons, we, we see the opening of the letter to the Philippians and uh, Paul's, uh, and we started with greetings and gratitude. Uh, there are a couple of points that I, was, I want to cover a little bit more uh, uh, in this particular lesson before I go into the lesson two. In this series, uh, I've entitled uh, Advance the Gospel Together with Joy. Many times you look at the book of Philippians, we see the word joy, right? But what is the purpose of that joy? Where did that joy come from? And we find that as we read deeper, as we really focus on what Paul is saying, uh, it's actually the gospel which brings him joy in spite of his uh, challenges, in, in spite even that he was kept in prison. And, uh, and now when he wrote the letter, he was not sure whether he's going to live or die. Yeah? So that is, that is uh, why I came to this uh, series and titled this series uh, of Philippians, Advance the Gospel Together with Joy. All right? And, uh, and indeed, Philippians 1 verse 12 says, what has happened to me has actually uh, caused us to, uh, to, to advance the, the gospel. So there are different aspects uh, of uh, what we will see uh, throughout the whole uh, book of Philippians. Right? And we're still at the part of uh, more or less like the introduction. And uh, the next lesson we'll look at is uh, the testimony of Paul. And it's a testimony of joy, uh, of joy in ministry. Uh, we have seen that the purpose was to encourage the believers uh, to remain uh, faithful to God and to work together to advance the gospel with joy, right? Uh, the reasons uh, we, we saw last week, okay? different areas, uh, different challenges, from opposition to divisions, to false teachers, to, to even uh, uh, great economic challenges. They were facing hardship in terms of uh, financial and other things. There was poverty uh, in their midst as well. So, uh, so but, uh, when we look at that, you know, when we look at the greetings, yeah, we, we see that the Paul's greeting was uh, full of uh, intimacy, it was very personal, it was very affectionate, and it was characterized like by joy, right? And the second area is uh, we find that uh, his 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 thankfulness and his joy is simply because of God's people and how they have supported him. The, how they uh, the the church in Philippi was the first mission outpost or the first preaching point, if we could say, uh, in Europe. When God led the Holy Spirit led Paul instead of going east where he wanted to do. Uh, he actually, the Holy Spirit says, go over to Macedonia, move west. And since then, the gospel, you know, uh, since Paul has been moving westward, yeah, Europe, and finally over to the U.S., and then uh, coming around to China, you know, and now moving back to Jerusalem again. And where the gospel is going, it will always bring the freedom and, 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 uh, and progress as well. Yeah? So we, we study... The, the movement of the gospel uh, in terms of economic and peace and stability and that kind of movement, uh, basically. So one of the things we find that uh, that Paul did was he thanked God. You know, we find it seldom that we find him thanking God, uh, thanking God for things, but he thanked God for people, right? And this is something I believe that is a, one of the practical things we, we can learn from there. Uh, many times you look for perfection for, from people, which we know that uh, sometimes we get disappointed. But, it, but Paul was looking for evidences of God's grace in people's lives. Yeah? And, and, uh, and he, he says that he who begins a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day uh, of the Lord, uh, the day of Christ Jesus. So something for us, an, an application point uh, in that. So Christian joy comes from Christ and from living in community. So there, there, are, there, are, there are two things that, that I think Paul encourages us, that he, the way he relates to the, to the Philippians was on the basis of the friendship that Christ has established in the midst of uh, his believers. We are friends. Jesus, remember, Jesus says, uh, you are my friends, right? If you obey what I, I uh, command you to do. And, uh, and uh, it, it's, it's as if that you, we come to, when we meet a fellow Christian, you say, oh, 
you know this person also, uh, or you know, you know this guy. Suddenly there is this bond, there is this rapport that is established. So when we need, meet another person and we find that he, he or she is a Christian, we say, oh, you love the Lord also, right? Uh, you, you are serving the Lord. And then we find it very easy to become friends, right? Because we share something in common. So we have a common savior. We have a, we're united by the Holy Spirit, right? The unity we talked about uh, is, is, is given by the Holy Spirit. And, and we are headed for glory together, you know? Uh, that uh, one of the days that we'll be taken up in glory as well. And we'll see the, 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 the face of our Lord Jesus Christ. We'll meet him face to face. So we have a common destiny. So, so it's important for us uh, to cultivate a kind of friendships. You see, sometimes it's uh, a little bit challenging for us uh, to, to find close friendships, uh, especially in church. Because there are a couple of things I think uh, we need to avoid. Uh, this is something, uh, these are just practical things for us to think about. Uh, four things to avoid. One is sensationalism. Second is mysticism. Three is idealism. And fourth is individualism. Uh, what does it mean? You know? So sometimes we, we fail to enjoy and to, uh, uh, our fellowship uh, together as Christians, as brothers and sisters in the Lord, as friends in the Lord, it's because we, we fall into those four traps. As a, a person who is sensationalist would find that, that uh, they find that the Christian community is not exciting enough. You know, they must always be on a high. There must always be, be, uh, be uh, something uh, extraordinary happening. You know, it must, it must be like a, always a concert style environment uh, whereby there's a lot of hype and things like that. But, but actually, in, in actual fact, the Christian community, right, it's not about shock and awe, but it is about serving. Serving quietly, serving faithfully, serving sacrificially. You know, and, and, uh, and a servant is not calling out for attention for, for himself or herself. So I think if we avoid that, you know, uh, that's, that's one of the things to avoid. The second one is mysticism. That, uh, a mystic will, find, will make the Christian life become... Uh, become very withdrawn and it's very quiet. It's just me and Jesus, right? It's just me and Jesus. It's a personal relationship. I remember a couple uh, from overseas one time and when it came to join, uh, when they came and, and joined us in, in our in church and later on we invited them to our cell groups, right? They, they, they says, this is very different. This is, this is very different. The experience of Christianity or the Christian faith is very, very different from when they were back in their home country. And back in the home country, it's just the, the husband and wife only. After dinner, they'll pray, and then, but then they don't have fellowship. Right? So mysticism says me and Jesus, but Christianity is about we and Jesus. We together and Jesus. Right? Uh, cultivate the life in community. The third area is idealism. Okay? So, so uh, idealism, that means idealists struggle in the community because, right, uh, they, they, we, an idealist have a dream, okay? I have an idea of what a perfect church is like. And when, when they cannot meet that perfection or when, when they cannot find that perfection or when the, the church cannot live up to their expectations, right? So they tend to, you know, be, become very disappointed. But remember, we're all sinners, right? Saved by the grace of God. And, and, and Paul uh, sees God as working through uh, the, the Philippine church, right? And in the midst of their struggles, in the midst of their disputes, in the midst of sometimes false teachers or, or wrong teachings that creep in, uh, he, he, he did not condemn them, but he actually corrected them, but he encouraged them. So don't fall into the trap that we must find a perfect church or we must find a perfect cell group. I must marry a perfect man, you know, uh, that kind of thing. Or I must marry a perfect woman, that kind of thing, All right? And the fourth one is individualism. You know, in, in, in the fact that uh, especially in this uh, situation whereby there's this online culture, right? And, and it, it, it withdraws, it causes us to withdraw to ourselves. It's just myself only. So it's very hard to establish and foster relationships. 
right, and community. We must also avoid that. Make every effort, you know, do not forsake the getting together. Uh, even, for example, we, 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 some of us, we cannot meet you know, physically together, but at least we make a very, uh, uh, an effort uh, just to come to church yeah, on a Sunday and then just greet one another, encourage one another, maybe go our own way. Right? Or sometimes we say, okay, uh, uh, with an extended family uh, or family in Christ, we, we minister to one, to, to one another in small groups. Right? It helps break this, uh, this trend or this obstacle of individualism. Yeah? And, and this is a challenge, especially for, for many people uh, who live in this uh, online world and they are not able to connect you know, face to face uh, with with uh, all the, the faults and, and all the shortcomings of others, right? All the preferences of others. So not only we talk about uh, friendships, right? Uh, that Christ has already established, the Holy Spirit has established, but even more exciting is what, what uh, uh, Paul talks about, the partnership that they have. So gospel friendships, right? Uh, lead into that kind of partnership. That means that, we are we are, we have a target. We have we are on mission together, and this way uh, Paul and the Philippians have this uh, goes beyond just a friendship, right? But they were on uh, they have a mission together. Uh, they send financial aid to help him, they, and through him they send financial aid as well to help other churches as well that were in need, especially for example the Jerusalem church, churches. And they suffered together, they encouraged one another in the Lord, and they never stopped praying for one another. So we see this joy coming through uh, uh, when, when we, when, when we uh, study the, uh, the, uh, the letter of Paul uh, in, in this way. Why is it always say, I give thanks to you. I thank my God every time I remember you. Okay? So, so the... Here, I just want to carry on. He says, he says uh, so, so when, when Paul writes to the Philippians, he expresses that in the midst of their struggles, yeah, he can relate with them and they can relate with him, but he has confidence. Now remember, he was, he was in, in chains or he was, his movement was restricted, yeah, and, but he had confidence in God's faithfulness to the Philippian Christians. He says, God is like a diligent worker. Yeah? He who began that good work in you will carry it. Okay? And the, the way he uses that, that, that phrase is, will continue to carry it to full completion until the day of Christ Jesus. So he, has, he says he's very confident of this, this particular thing. right? And this is a fact. This is sure 100% guaranteed. Right? And his confidence is in the Lord. The, the way that God has been faithful to the Philippians in the past is now uh, the same thing that give him the confidence that uh, God will continue to sustain them even in the midst of the, the persecution and the troubles that they face. And, and he says, we'll carry it to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. He said, how long will God work in them? It says, as long as it is needed. As long as it is needed. As long as we need help, God is there for us. Yeah? And uh, why, why it says he put the limit? Until the day of Christ Jesus. It's the same uh, reference as the day of the Lord. Remember, the, uh, Paul was facing uh, uh, his persecutors, uh, his jailers, the Philippine church and the early Christians who are, will be facing uh, greater and greater persecution as well. And uh, it says, and people wonder, you know, will there ever be justice? Will there be, will there be ever be relief? Yeah. And uh, and in in the Old Testament and in the New Testament carries the idea of the day of the Lord. It is a time when Christ comes back, when God's wrath and judgment on sinful men and and people who reject Christ, uh, it, it will be manifested. God will come and judge. God will come and set things right. And this idea is in the Old Testament. This idea is in the New Testament as well. And here Paul echoes it until the day of Christ Jesus. And Jesus himself said, I will come back again. Right? And when the Son of Man will come back. This is a side-by-side -side comparison 
uh, in that way, I said from Isaiah to, uh, chapter 13, uh, and you can read a, a lot of other verses from Zephaniah, from Obadiah, from Joel, and so on and so forth. Let me just read for us. It says, see, the day of the Lord is coming. It's a cruel day. It's, a, it's a wrath and fierce anger to make the land desolate and destroy the sinners within. Right? This is the judgment of the Lord. Right? The stars of heaven and their constellations will not show their light. The rising sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. And the Lord says, I will punish the world for its evil, the wicked for their sins. I will put an end to the arrogance of the haughty and will humble the pride of the rulers, and so on and so forth. Right? So that, that, that idea and that uh, conviction uh, of the, that God will come and set things right, as in the Old Testament, is Jesus himself repeated, and, and Paul himself would write to the Thessalonians as well. It says, now brothers and sisters and dads, we do not need to know, for you know very well that the, day, the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Right? When people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly. Right? But you, brothers and sisters, you are not in darkness. So that day should not surprise you uh, like a thief. So we are aware. Right? We are aware. We are not dismayed. Even we may be, uh, like Paul is kept uh, in the darkness of the dungeon, but yet, he, uh, the light, he understands the light of the Lord, right? And the day of the Lord is a time when God will vindicate him. God will set things right. Right? So there is encouragement. So we can read about that in First Thessalonians 5, 2 Peter 3, in Revelations, in Matthew chapter 24, that when Jesus talks about the coming of the Son of Man as well. So through this, even though we go through difficulties, we can be assured of the love of God and the confidence in God's faithfulness with us. God will help us as long as we need as long as we call upon his name. So, so in verse 7, it says, It was right for me to feel this way about all of you. I have you in my heart, right? Whether I'm in chains or defending or confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. And God can testify how I, and the way he uses uh, the, 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 this phrase is, I continually and earnestly long for you with the affection, uh, the other translation you can say, yeah, with the compassion of Christ Jesus. So he was confident uh, in God's grace for them, right? And he had compassion for them. So God's grace is not just talking about God providing a way for us to be safe, but not only he saves us, but he sustains us. He gives us the strength for that endurance. And Paul is saying that, uh, that whether he's defending, look at the words defending, vindicating, or confirming, or, or testifying, he, he's using court language, right? Court language, uh, which Sister Lily will be very aware, you know, uh, defending uh, 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 the defendant or the conviction or the, and all those things, yeah? uh, calling up witnesses to testify. Yeah? So God strengthens Paul and he says that the strength that God gives to me, he will also give to you in the midst of your struggles, in the midst of your, your, your desire to advance the gospel. So continue to rely on God. Never lose, never give up on God. So the trial, many times we, we, we see the trial, you know, uh, we say we want to prove our innocence. But Paul did not see his trial as uh, uh, the primary means to secure his release. But he sees it as, as a, it is a, a chance for him to validate the claims of the gospel, to preach the gospel to judges, to, to, uh, to court officials, to rulers, to the palace guards, and so on. So whether I'm in chains or defending or, or confirming, all of you share in God's grace with me. Now, we are in this together. We have the same pool of resource that will sustain us from now, from our situation now, good or bad, till eternity. And this is what he's saying, God's grace is sufficient for you. 
as it is sufficient for me. What God begins, He will bring it to completion as a good workman. Right? So, and as we look now in verse 9 to 11, uh, we see that portion of His prayer that this is my prayer. This is my continuing prayer uh, that your love, in the way he uses, uh, writes a love is agape, which is the sacrificial love that God demonstrates for us, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and in depth of insight. Right? So this is his prayer. These are three things he prayed for. That uh, they, they would have the sacrificial love, and that love will continue to grow. Grow to the point whereby it, it, it gives the idea of overflowing. As, you, as, as uh, water is poured into a container, there's so much water that the container could not fill it, it kind of overflows. That that love of God is meant to overflow in the Philippians' life. Right? And he also talked about the knowledge. That knowledge is talking about the knowledge of God. To know God and have the depth of insight. And the insight is, is you are able to experience that application of that knowledge uh, in, into your very life. You have experienced the goodness of God. So, so this is something that Paul's prayer is, right? And the reason he prayed for that is verse 10, it says, so that, right? So that, so that you may be able to discern what is best, and may be pure and blameless. Uh, yeah, another way of translating is impeded uh, 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 for the day of Christ. Remember, again, he repeated two times. When Christ comes back, they may be found pure. They may be found blameless. Yeah? Filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, through the glory and praise of God. So he, he, that's his desire. That's his, uh, his, his wish. Uh, that is, he prayed for the Philippine Christians, and, and uh, isn't it great that right? if somebody prays for us that we will have this as well discernment, purity, uh, purity righteousness, and that ultimately our life will bring glory to God, not shame to Christ. Right? That, that idea of discernment is actually remember Philippi, there in Philippi, there are gold mines around that area. And, and uh, for people, uh, for those who are gold miners, they need to know whether there is, there is uh, origin, good gold or fake gold, right? There is this called fool's gold. So then they, they need to have that kind of discernment. Yeah? Uh, what is best? Right? What is best? It could be that idea of best, it could be referring to, the, uh, to what Paul is teaching, right? Uh, that is one, one way of saying, you know, that is they are able to, to discern false teaching as compared to uh, false teachers that can't, wants to, to steal, uh, to, to, to corrupt uh, the church. So it says that's part of the, uh, the way that we can understand that, to discern what is best, yeah? And to be pure, right? Uh, and to be uh, blameless, okay? Be found faultless, yeah? So, so it's not just about the knowledge, but it is about the, the soul, that they, they are, they are growing together, growing in holiness, yeah? in the, the desire to be holy, to give, to give glory to God. Right? And the fruit of righteousness is what they are looking for. So the Christian life is saying is this, it's not just that one is, I'm saved and then I sit back and I don't progress. And he's saying that all this, we must continue to grow in it. Okay? So the Christian life is never stagnant. The Christian life is, uh, is, is never boring, actually, all right? Uh, it is full of challenges. And how does it, uh, how can we actually sustain the Christian life? Definitely not our own. It says that fruit of righteousness, verse 11, comes through Jesus Christ. That strength, that ability, that, that power comes through Christ himself. So what he's saying to, uh, to, to the Philippine Christians, and I believe to us, is just don't settle for a superficial knowledge of God. Yeah? Uh, we begin with trying to understand and trying to grasp in our mind, 
who God is, uh, we study, and, and there is this uh, that part, what we call the intellectual knowledge, the academic knowledge of Christ, uh, of who God is, and so on. But we must also have that intimacy, that uh, experiential knowledge of God. How real is God to you in your life, day in and day out, from year to year? Are we growing in the knowledge and in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ? Two things, the grace, in the, uh, the knowledge and the head, and the grace, the outworking of, uh, uh, of our relationship with God and with people. So this is, this is Paul's uh, prayer and desire for the churches, right? For, the, for, the, for these partners in the gospel. And today we are also known as, uh, we, are, we can consider ourselves partners in, in the gospel as well. Uh, friends in the gospel and partners in the gospel. If there's something that you, I remember uh, a sister in Christ once said, you know, uh, Pastor, Pastor, I don't know what to pray for you. you know? uh, I said, there are many things you can pray for me, but, but if there's anything, uh, I think this is, this is a good prayer. We can pray for one another. That we may have knowledge, we may have discernment, uh, we may have uh, purity, that uh, all these good things will continue to grow in us. Love, knowledge, insight experience of God, knowing God in a deeper way. So this is what I want to cover uh, for the first uh, uh, section uh, that is from verse, verse uh, 1 to 11. And let me just then go into the next, next lesson. This next lesson we talk about, uh, we'll carry on from verse 12 to verse 18a, right? Uh, uh, Brian talked about uh, reading uh, chapter uh, 1 verse 26. I don't I think tonight I can't cover until that. So I, I will use another session to cover until that, the, the end of the chapter. But let us just uh, read uh, verse 12 to 14. Right? It says, now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, this is what happened to me, uh, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear through the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and they all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The others, the latter do so out of love, knowing that I'm put here for the, God, for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? Verse 18, it says, the important thing that in, is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached, and because of this, I rejoice. You know, uh, what an amazing attitude right, uh, for Paul, you know. Uh, he could have taken a very, uh, uh, he could be very discouraged to say, I'm in prison, I cannot do anything, right? And there are people out there, you know, who are uh, stealing my crown, you know, uh, stealing my glory, and I, I'm feeling so useless here, right? So, so there are many things that sometimes when we, uh, when it comes to doing the work of God, and, and sometimes we feel that there are certain restrictions that we we uh, we may face, or some certain setbacks, and we see other churches or we see other groups flourishing very well, and we get very upset. But Paul did not, right? Uh, and and uh, and this this is the, the three things uh, we can see here that he stayed focused, right? Uh, he focused on the joy of his of ministry, right? And, and he put the gospel first, and he put the uh, Christ glory first. And he rejoiced when Christ is preached. Right? Let me just uh, run through a couple of things for us. One, uh, we see that uh, at this section, from verse twelve uh, to verse eighteen, 
uh, he is uh, it is in the form of like his testimony a testimony is something that like what you 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 tell others what you have seen or what you have experienced personally so that is uh, you know, what i want you to uh, now what i i want you to know brothers and sisters that what has happened to me right so paul is giving his testimony and now this is something that's uh, also very powerful for all of us uh, that uh, sometimes you do not know where to start in sharing the gospel and you can start with your testimony your personal testimony what was it like for me before i became a christian what happened and how did i come to know the lord and uh, hearing some of your testimonies is amazing right and it continues to amaze me even if you tell it a hundred times i'm still amazed at the grace of god yeah and what god is doing how god just uses and leads each one of us in such a different way yeah, uh, uh, to himself right uh, uh, nothing else but that's the amazing grace of god so paul was writing it in, in the form of self this is what happened to me I, i'm telling you and even though i'm in this uh, people say i'm i'm not in the best position but actually uh, my my uh, my situation is uh, God has orchestrated it so that uh, the gospel can advance. So he was in prison, and most uh, scholars would say that he is he's writing uh, around the 80s, 60s uh, from Rome. Maybe at the time he had uh, he was under house arrest. It's possible uh, because uh, he had a lot of uh, you know uh, he had access to the guards, you know, the Praetorium guards. The Praetorium is uh, the armies are the palace guards and the uh, Caesar's household. Right, so even though he was faced with critics and uh, that we read earlier and competitors, uh, uh, yet uh, he still rejoices. So he stayed focused. What is the 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 key to his joy is that he stayed focused on Jesus. So he made the the gospel the focus of life and ministry. I think if we focus on other things, right, we get disappointed. But once we see somebody coming to know the lord once we see the gospel advancing once we see the breakthrough in in our relatives lives you know in our loved ones uh, like uh this this during lunch time and uh, i was just sharing with the group when we were praying we were praying for my parents as well and today is my mother's birthday she's 81 years old she doesn't know the lord yet right she was so close you now when we were uh, when pat was sharing uh, uh, sharing the gospel with her many years ago, she ne- she wanted to accept the Lord, but something happened, right? So we're still uh, praying for her. And my dad will be 82 in two days' time, 9/11, yeah, uh, both of them in September. So make the gospel the focus of life and ministry. And uh, and and he did not compare, right? He says, uh, he didn't say, oh, this person is more successful than me. You know, this, these are my, and he becomes my, he or she becomes my competitor, right? I should do more than him. No, he rejoices when the gospel, you know, when somebody preaches the gospel. And even on the other side, they had critics, you know, who say maybe when they, when they preach the gospel and they do it very well and, and Paul will get into trouble. Paul will get in trouble because the gospel, and, and as they say, is Paul's doing that. Yeah, he's the one who who, who tells us to do so. We do, no? yeah, maybe you know they do it that way, but he avoided comparison. He cared more about Jesus and his glory rather than his own glory. What are we doing to serve to advance the gospel? What situation in our lives uh, are we uh, are we experiencing that can help us? advance the gospel are we in a position guys do we recognize that god has put us in a particular situation in the context of our work in the context of our family uh, what are they doing uh, what is god doing you know what are we hearing from god in that way so stay focused on jesus and in that way you know we we see that paul had put the gospel first as a result it says uh, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, uh, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord. And there, all the more to proclaim the gospel. The word uh, uh, is, uh, earlier we saw this advance. It is blazing trail. 
in, in times of warfare. It's an army cutting through, you know, uh, to, to make headway uh, into enemy territory. So, so Paul is using that military term. The gospel is making inroads into new ter ter territory, into new people, uh, living strata of society, from the, from, the, from the servants to the soldiers to, the, to their superiors, uh, this is where uh, Paul is saying he's so glad it is penetrating through different levels of society, wherever he's in contact with. So circumstances he sees are God-ordained opportunities. People are hearing the gospel, and not only that, he sees the church being emboldened. Brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord, and people are speaking the gospel. Right? Even I remember the first time, you know, somebody wrote me a card, you know, when I was not a Christian yet. It was a birthday card, and they sent it all the way from a place called Simunjan, uh, uh, and I was in Sydney. Uh, I've only met the person once, but in that birthday card, uh, the, it was written, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. John 3.16. That was my first exposure to the gospel, right? And this is what happens. Uh, be bold to share the gospel in any way you can. So Paul put the gospel ahead of his personal wants and priorities. And, and we see that even though he, he went to prison and he was uh, afflicted, but through his affliction, others' faith, the faith of brothers and sisters in Christ, while being built up, even though he had to suffer. And so they became confident in the Lord. So the last part is, you no, know, uh, it says this, it is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, uh, they, uh, knowing that I, I put here for the defense of the gospel, the former preach Christ uh, out of selfish ambition and not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. There were two conflicting motives, envy and rivalry, right? And whatever the reason is, whatever the motive is, as long as Jesus is preached faithfully and, and, and truly, there is no error about, uh, in terms of uh, who Jesus is and what he has done. There's no error in the gospel. Paul is okay with that, right? He says, because of that, I rejoice. I rejoice that uh, as long as Christ is preached, I rejoice. So this is one of the takeaway things uh, for us from this point is that we ourselves need to be aware of jealousy and envy in our ministry. We are not in competition with other churches, with other Christian groups. We're not in competition with, uh, with other ministries, also within the church. Sometimes we, we, we do struggle for, in terms of uh, uh, what to call this, if we have constraints uh, in terms of people who can serve. And sometimes we see people uh, serving in multiple ministries and one ministry will run to drag the other person and things like that. I hope that we can continue to work together, all right? And more, encourage more to come in and serve, yeah? our friends and, and others. And also, uh, uh, please uh, correct my, my spelling, uh, please uh, uh, excuse my spelling. Beware of the temptation, all right? I, I don't know why in that way I put an option of patient, right? Temptation to promote ourselves in ministry. Okay? So I think this is something that I, uh, you actually see this kind of philosophy coming up, you know, when uh, Normally, for example, we talk about promoting uh, our services and things like that. Uh, I, I would rather put okay, the church, the congregation up as, as, as our, uh, on a publicity uh, poster rather than the speaker uh, themselves, okay? unless it's an outside speaker. Right? So, I mean, these are little things that we, uh, I think, I think is important for us. Yeah? Uh, we don't want to promote ourselves in ministry, but we want to promote Christ through our ministry. So, so sometimes God does bless us, you know, or bless you in your ministry. And, and strangely enough, others may envy. So don't be surprised by others uh, 
uh, wanting to do better than you or wanting or envious than you. So don't be surprised by that, but ask God to give you grace, uh, give you grace uh, for to 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 continue to serve uh, and to 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 work with others. So in all this, that's why Paul have joy uh, in his ministry, and Paul can rejoice when Christ is preached. Are we rejoicing uh, in, in PBC because Christ is preached? That's all I want to share for tonight. So thank you very much.